Well, I was speaking about um, the spiritual government of the world yesterday and the um, guidance behind um, everything. And of course, there's the guidance at the, perf at the um, personal level. And then there's the guidance of the whole of humanity. It's like, in a certain sense, one can consider humanity as one being that is evolving. Just a moment ago, I, I watched um, a rush of birds all flying in a certain direction. And where it was just like, it was just one current of life, like the birds were all part of just one being, or like a riff of corals, it's all one being. The humanity, Hazrat Inad Khan sees humanity as a being. And you see very extraordinary things happen within uh, a conglomerate, like for example a beehive. They are all focused in making a queen out of one of them. One of them it grows and grows and grows and grows and becomes the queen. And it's like the convergence of the consciousness of all beings that makes one being incorporate all beings. There was a wonderful story that Martin Buber told of the Hasidims, that they were all um, standing on each other's shoulders, building a bridge between earth and heaven so that the teacher could look into the heavens. And that's a little bit something like what happens in a Himalayan expedition. Think of all that groundwork so that one being may... But he's not there alone, you see. He's, he sees for everybody. It's like you hear in the newspaper that some astronomer has discovered a new planet. And actually it's just as you haven't seen it, but, well, he's, he's seen it for you. The whole world has seen it through him. That's the experience of the messenger. And, of course, it is true, Hazrat Inad Khan himself always says, well, the messenger is only a cover, it's the message that counts. Yes, that's what he says. But um, the greatest thing that is ever achieved is uh, that the divine perfection should be incorporated in a being. I mean, that's what it's all about. Um, in all beings, of course, but um, by a communication of beings, the realization of one being is spread to more beings. The ideal is, of course, that all beings should manifest divine perfection, but, and it's open to all beings. It is open to all beings. But sometimes people are very glad that somebody else can do it for them. <laughs> That's why people look to Christ to do the salvation for them. That comes in the, whole, in the cosmic mass. There's a moment when everybody feels that, well, the weight of responsibility of those high functions is so great. The sacrifice is so great. Just imagine what must be the crucifixion of the one who has taken upon himself to be the point of convergence of the whole humanity. A million searchlights are upon him, says Hazrat Inad Khan. He becomes the interpreter of the word of God in the human language. And of course, what he receives is far beyond anything that he can express in words. He is to be connected with the source all the time. He has to be as fine as a silken thread. And he can tune his lute as high as the strings can bear. And yet he has to be so tender and responsive, and yet at the same time so firm to bear all things. He has to be in the world and yet not of the world. 
He has to be a human being and he has to be beyond a human being. The Rasul is the soul through which God himself has attained that which is the purpose of creation. In other words, the Rasul is the one who represents God's perfection through human limitation. Now, of course, every one of us experiences to some extent uh, some degree of perfection functioning within limitation. For example, when you experience the limited conditions in which you are functioning, I again uh, invoke the example of Jesus captured by the Romans. Divine perfection, you know, functioning within limitation. You, when your soul is uh, meeting with um, acrimony, with, um, with human humiliation, Uh, those are those moments when, and you hold your head high, those are those moments when you're conscious of the divine perfection in you and the tremendous limitation to which this, this greatness is, has to be subjected as it functions on the earth plane. You are experiencing the experience of the prophet, of the messenger. And it is quite a different thing. If you experience your limitation, well, then you're limited. But if you experience the divine perfection functioning within limitation, that's the experience of the messenger. He gives warnings to humanity. We've said uh, what the master is like, but can you imagine what a prophet is like? Hmm? There's something of the prophet in every being. He comes out of the solitude with a warning. Think of the prophets of Israel. Think of Elijah, for example. He comes out of the solitude and comes and he warns people. And then he might be crucified for having warned people. But his job is to go forward. Think of uh, Jesus sent his disciples to go forward. Said, go forward and heal people. And he said, how can we heal? Never mind, you go forward and heal people. And, well, they did. And he said, if the people in the villages don't accept you, um, shake the dust of your clothes in the village and go to the next one. And finally, lo and behold, they were able to heal. He was making prophets out of ordinary beings. That's what the messenger does. His being turns you into a prophet because he makes you realize that the only thing that is worth the while doing in life, something that is worth the while dying for, that's what is worth the while living for. And the rest is peanuts. You know, when, when one measures the, the importance of one is, what is doing in life, there comes a time that one, one feels, well, is that it? Is that it? Something in one, there's a kind of flame in one that arises and feels like saying, well, that's not what it's about. What is it that is worthwhile doing? Of course, it is giving guidance. It is heeding the divine guidance and communicating that guidance. Like, for example, you say, oh, well, children are dying in India. Well, what can I, I'm sorry about it, but what can I do about it? People are killing each other in the war. What can I do about it? It's in the hands of the government. I have nothing to do with it. It isn't true. It's not good enough not to do something wrong yourself. You still have to really be able to say that I'm doing everything that I can about it. That's the kind of thing that makes a profit. The other person who says, well, I don't want to bother about things that don't concern me because I have enough to do with my own job. Yes, of course, you can fill your life with your own job. Or then you can give up everything and do what you feel is really important. That's the stuff of which prophets are made. It's only for the lion-hearted, the strong in spirit. 
And they become stronger by the fact that they are committing themselves to the service of God and humanity. Of course, there are different types. You see, he says, the lion-like soul of the deva, the angel man, comes to the rescue of humanity. Of course, um, there's, uh, there are several types, of course. There is the, um, the reformer. Mm-hmm. The reformer is a prophet. It's a man who spends half his time in jail. <laughs> the reformer. He's, he makes himself... He's most loved and most hated, and he doesn't care. He's, uh, he has committed himself to bring about a change, and whatever happens, he's prepared to pay for his life for that, what he believes in. That's the thing, that, that the kind of stuff that makes a reformer. Oh, then there is the inspirer, and he comes and he just stands on the soapbox and speaks to the people in the park, you know. but. His conviction is so strong that he just carries the hearts of people, inspires them by his being. And of course, what is the power behind the prophet? It is that he is conscious of the manner of God. Now, you see, when you say the manner of God, it sounds so strange. I know to a lot of people, because a lot of people think God something up there, the absolute, you know, kind of vague and... No, the manner of God. That's the message of Hazrat Inatha, the manner of God. Because God, a reality down here in beings, that's the manner of God. When you come across a being and you think, well, I don't know, it's, he's like a king. He's, I, I never knew that it was possible for there to be a human being who is like that. He, he manifests all that I imagine God must be like. That's the manner of God. Majesty. Sovereignty. Great peace. Authority. Kingliness. When um, Hazrat Naid Khan was driving, I think if Mr. Ford um, gave him a car, and um, it was 1920. I think 23, 24, something like that. And uh, I still remember his passing his uh, permit around. <laughs> He'd, he had kept it a complete secret that he was learning how to drive a car. <laughs> and he took it out of his pocket. And then, <clears throat> well, he drove very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so the cars behind him were hooting and hooting. Qu'est-ce que c'est que c'est imbécile? <laughs> and they passed him <laughs> and they took off their hats. <laughs> that is the consciousness of God. It's the consciousness of the king. He says it's like walking upon a rope, matter on one side and spirit on the other, heaven on one side and earth on the other, the imperfect self journeying towards perfection and at the same time bearing the burden of numberless souls. See, because there's still a fragility of the human being, and then you've gone beyond the point when he's become so cosmic, he's gone beyond the point of being a human being, and still the body is human, and the mind is still a vehicle that is, has all its imperfections, and it's containing all of this, this perfection in it. And then think of stretching your consciousness so high that on one hand you can hear the, 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 the voice of God, and on the other hand you can hear the call of human beings, the call of human beings. When one is absorbed in one's own problems, of course, one just doesn't have time. Occasionally one comes across somebody who complains about his life and his problems. Imagine you get to a point when you become like a central telephone exchange and there are calls from every corner of the globe and it's not just personal problems but the whole problem of humanity today there are problems in humanity today 
you, you, you go pollution <laughs> and so on and so forth. Yeah. There's all these problems. And there comes a time when you realize that your particular problems are just not important. And then you do something to meet with world problems, like uh, starting a commune. <laughs> something to do with how people live, how to help people to find a way of living, a new way, uh, conform to a new pattern that is coming in the new age. That's a prophetic mission. Helping people to live. And you see the despair in the souls of people. It's not just their personal problems, like the person they loved has died, or they haven't been able to get the position that they wanted, or whatever. Those are personal problems. But there is a kind of despair in the soul of people, a despair about meaningfulness. It's the metaphysical anguish that Heidegger spoke about whether this all makes sense or what it's all about. Where are we going? What is this all leading to? That's the, those are the major problems in the consciousness of men. When they have their stomachs full, of course, when they're fasting, like in India, well then, that's that fasting that is the major problem. You know. So it's the ability of the soul to climb to a high pitch, but not like in meditation where you just come to a realization for yourself, but you are carrying the whole of humanity into your realization. When the, the spacemen were first uh, moving towards the moon, the whole of humanity was constant converging upon those two people. He's trying to present to the world the whole ocean in a bottle. I hope that you felt and the little that we've done so far of the teaching of Moshe, you felt, you know, it's like a tremendous vastness and, and it's just so overwhelming. And then there's, well, we feel like little containers that are here trying to get a little bit of it within the framework of our understanding. And it's forcing us always to en <coughs> enlarge our capacity because there's so much wealth and so much bounty. And the thing about it is to make God a reality. Like in the old days, of course, maybe one could speak about God and people would believe in God, but today people are very realistic. It's no use speaking about God, you have to be God. You have to manifest God's being. Otherwise it falls flat. And so the prophetic mission is the one of manifesting God's being. He calls it to make God intelligible. And, of course, in order to do so, one has to think wide, you see, think vast, whereas uh, one is used to thinking small. That's what Hazrat Inat Khan was doing to his pupils, to teach them to think on the scale of humanity, like, for example, the, it is the development of humanity that culminates in divinity. And thus Christ is the example of the culmination of humanity. He says, uh, divinity is the imperfection of God, that is, God becoming imperfect in man, but it is still the perfection of man. It is just like a drop of water, which is entirely and absolutely water, and yet it is a drop in comparison with the ocean. The ocean is God, but the drop is divine. You see, what the prophet really does is to bring the living God to humanity, and that's why the Christians were right in uh, seeing God in Christ. And yet, he is seen by all, and yet not really seen. He is known by many, and yet recognized by few. He speaks to all, yet his silence quickens every soul. Most attached is he, and yet so detached. Most interested, and yet indifferent. Sad of disposition, and yet most joyous. Poor as man can be, and yet so rich. King in his soul, he yet walks with the bowl of the beggar in his hand from door to door. Warning of danger, and consoling the broken-hearted. Comrade of the youthful, and friend of the aged. Master of life within and without. 
Yet the servant of all, such is the being of the master. He is man in the sight of man, but God in the being of God. Now, of course, it is true that um, all beings are the, the receptacles of God's message, but uh, only in as much as they really commit themselves to acting as such. And therefore he says, you all, including Moshid, make the embodiment. You are the embodiment which is to give the message of today. All objects and all conditions convey to us the message of the one and only being. But the difference is that although they convey the message of God, they do not know it. They are not conscious of it. Do you know how one being can influence the whole world? One person's chaotic influence can put the whole world in despair. We've experienced it a few decades ago. And so why should people doubt that one person can save the whole world, as has been the contention of the Christians? The prophets are in continual contact with the angels. In fact, their souls have never been disconnected from the angelic plane. And therefore, the prophet acts as a link between heaven and earth. There's a story that Moshed often tells about a great prophet, and uh, he left to um, go to the Mount Sinai, and he took his eldest son with him, and um, uh, said that he would return. And uh, it, so much time had passed, and he didn't return, and um, the children were grown up, and the mother had died, and they were waiting for word for him, but nothing happened. And then when this eldest son, they said his smooth face had become bearded, and his cheerful look had given place to a serious expression. And um, the first the servants didn't recognize him. And then he said, my brothers, um, come, uh, I want to show you our father. I have come from my father, who is very peaceful in, his, in the wilderness, and to bring you his love and his message. And they answered, how can you say you came from him, who has gone for such a long time, and we have had no sign of him? And he said, well, ask your mother. And they said, well, our mother has died. Well, consult your guardians. And Guardian said, we don't know you, we, we don't know who you are. And um, so that's what's happening to people all the time. The, um, if uh, the messenger comes back, they don't recognize him. If the messenger, if uh, Christ were to come back today and walk into one of our cathedrals here, I don't think that people would, um, would, would accept him. Hazrat Nayat Khan was very conscious of this problem because, um, you know, we're living at a time when there are so many false masters. And uh, the fact is that people don't have very much of a criteria as to how to recognize the real from the false. Uh, people give their allegiance to a certain idea that they have, a concept of Christ, for example, and then once they have taken that view, then no other person can be in any way represent um, uh, the messenger because they have attached themselves to a particular being. But Christ himself said, I am Alpha and Omega, which means that I have been here before and I will come again. All prophets and seers who came before Jesus, whether it were Abraham or Zarathustra or Buddha or Krishna, and he said also, the Son of Man will come. There's, um, as you probably know, in Islam, it is um, said that um, there is no prophet after Muhammad. And because of this, Surawadi, for example, was crucified. And Abdul Baha, because uh, Surawadi was asked, but do you believe that God could create another prophet after Muhammad? And he said, well, I think God has enough freedom to be able to <laughs> produce another prophet he wishes. And um, then he was, uh, he was executed by the order of the, the Saladin. 
the Saladin of the Crusades. Um, Baha'u'llah, as you know, was, in, uh, was imprisoned in Jaffa. Uh, the Baha'is had been completely uh, banished from uh, Iran because of the claim of uh, Dul Baha to be a prophet. What exactly are the terms used um, officially in Islam? It is Khatam al awliya which means that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. Now, it's very important for you to know if you, are Sufi, uh, if you join, uh, if you take initiation in the Sufi order and you go to a Muslim country hmm, and they say, are you Muslims? And they say, no. And you say, well, how can you be a Sufi without being a Muslim? And you say, well, I am. <laughs> hmm? Well, I mean, do you accept that uh, Muhammad is the last of the prophets? Well, then you are in trouble. And, you know, how can you discuss these things? Well, what Khatam al means is the seal. And it means that there's a seal. There's no seal that cannot be opened. Though it must not be opened by everyone, but only by the one who has the right to open it. And when the seal is broken, the matter which one wants to read is disclosed. So it is with the words of the Prophet. And when the seal is opened, then everything is disclosed just as an open book. Verily, the words of the Prophets are like seals upon the secret of God. And so the seal has been placed there for the one who's supposed to open it. And that's how the continuation goes on. They're the one who was able to open the seal, who was the continuator of the tradition. Now, the meaning of um, this all is that uh, in the early days, like at the time of Krishna and Shiva and Buddha, it was necessary for the prophets to claim to be prophets because uh, in the conception of the people, uh, the prophet is the incarnation of God, of Brahma. And therefore, they were called avatars. And even today, of course, some of them claim to be avatars, which means the reincarnation of a previous master. But um, in Israel, the whole psychological climate was much more democratic. In the West altogether, of course, uh, the ego is much stronger and people don't like to consider that somebody should be half God and they are only ordinary humans. And so um, the claim is just uh, not allowed. And uh, so what it really means is that from the time of Muhammad, it is not done, let's say. It's not desirable for the prophet to claim to be a prophet. That's what it means. It doesn't mean there can't be any prophets, but it's, uh, it has to remain a kind of secret. That's what it's meant to do. It has to speak of itself. Otherwise, you have these masses of people, there's so many people claiming to be prophets. And just uh, depreciates the value of... Uh, Prophethood altogether. <laughs> <laughs> now, Murshid speaks about the idiosyncrasies of the different prophets. He said, for example, when wealth was esteemed, the message was delivered by King Solomon. When beauty was worshipped, Joseph, the most handsome, gave the message. When music was regarded as celestial, David gave his message in song. When there was curiosity about miracles, Moses brought his message. When sacrifice was highly esteemed, Abraham gave the message. When heredity was recognized, Christ gave his message as the Son of God. And when democracy was necessary, Muhammad gave his message as the servant of God, one like all and among all. Hindu prophets claimed to be God themselves. The reason was that, owing to their philosophical evolution, the people of India were ready to accept the divine in man. But in Arabia and Palestine, on the contrary, even the prophetic claim aroused such opposition against the prophets 
that their lives were in danger and their mission became most difficult for them to perform. Now, Mushid speaks about uh, Jesus and Muhammad. The word of God was born again among the descendants of Ishmael, Muhammad, who glorified the name of the Lord Abraham aloud. This was heard from the depth of the earth to the summit of heaven and re-echoed from the North Pole to the South Pole. It shook the nations. What you are speaks louder than what you say. That's what makes the prophet. It is their personality, and that is why when um, Jesus said, I'll make you uh, fishermen of men, what he meant was, I'll make you the living examples of the message. We have this um, same idea of the, the embodiment of all masters in all different religions. Like, for example, in the time of Krishna, it was said, we appear on earth when Dharma is corrupted, and that was long before the coming of Christ. And Muhammad said, I existed even before this creation and shall remain after assimilation. What is necessary today is to find the first and last religion. It's the one spirit behind all different spirits. Now, Moses showed that illumination can come to a soul in a moment. In his encounter with God in the bush, um, about Muhammad, you know that um, there was a f parliament in Medina where every man and woman in the city had the right to vote. And this happened 1,500 years ago. 1,400 years ago. And uh, as he was sitting in the mountains of Gari Hira, he heard a voice saying to him, Cry out the sacred name of thy Lord. And then he started receiving his messages. And Halima says that the um, breast of the Prophet was opened and uh, some undesirable matter was removed from it. And you know that Jesus is traced back to the family of Isaac and Muhammad from the family of Ishmael. Hazrat Anad Khan calls Christ Jesus the Mushid of Mushids. And he said, some object to Christ being called divine, but if divinity is not sought in man, then in what shall we seek God? The Son of Man is he who finds out and who is conscious of his inheritance from God and not of that from man. One who is conscious of his earthly origin is an earthly man. One who is conscious of his heavenly origin is a son of God. Christ's ideal is the picture of the perfect man, and the explanation of what the perfect man is and what are his possibilities can be seen in the verse of the Bible, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. In the garb of man, Christ manifested. Those who do not want Christ to be a man drag down the greatness and sacredness of the human being by their argument, by saying that man is made in sin. But there is nothing wrong in calling Christ God or divine. It is in man the divine perfection is to be seen. He identified himself with the spirit of which he was conscious. The spirit of perfection which lived before Jesus and will continue to live to the end of the world for eternity. You see, the whole message of Pir Mushtinat Khan was really centered upon the finding God in man. If ever man has found God manifest on earth, it is in the godly. Uh, with all the arguments for and against the divinity of Christ, no sincere believer in God can deny that God had been reflected in the personality of the Master. And, of course, the perfect picture of, uh, the, um, of God functioning in limitation in the human being is, of course, the Christ on the cross, because um, his hands and feet are nailed, manifesting 
the helplessness of God that he has accepted out of his free will because of the limitations in which his perfection has to function. And yet, on the other hand, the unlimited power of that being who could dispel this imperfection if he so wished. It's like the greatest renunciation. But the renunciation in which there's a source of all freedom. The sign of the messenger is the dove. It is sometimes Cupid. He is meant to guide the longing soul towards the divine beloved. And it is the crescent moon. A murid once asked Hazrat Inad Khan, what could I do best to serve the cause? And Murshid said, I am the cause. And a few days uh, before Murshid went to the other side of life, Murshid said, looking at the guy and Vardhan lying next to the bed, they are the Koran of the present time. Now these are the words that, these are really parting words that Murshid said. If I were to tell you that I am so-and-so, or so-and-so, that, uh, that would not give you anything. And if I told you that I am this or I am that, then it would be a thought, a belief, which I have taught you to believe in. I would rather not do it. Besides, truth is its own evidence. What is true will sound itself in every heart sooner or later. The message of God is the truth that must echo sooner or later through the heart. And no claims, no proclamations, no recommendations, no pleadings will make anything true which is not true. And what is true cannot be spoiled or denied or stopped by anybody. What is true will prove to be true to the end. You learn the path of realization of God, the path of philosophy without any claim on my part. Let your heart tell you about the message about your mushid. On the part of mushid, there is no attempt to make you feel or know what Mushid is. Besides, it is not enough to know that Mushid is your friend, your father, your counsellor, someone who understands you, someone who stands by you in your struggles, in sorrows and in joy. That is enough. We shall work together, we shall stand hand in hand to do the service to humanity. So, so we'll just have a few minutes of silence. 